As an introduction, we'd like to acknowledge that our mission at Vos Library is to advance learning, inspire curiosity, enrich lives, and promote community. And with that in mind, let me introduce our guest. Anne Britting Olson lives and writes from the mountains of central Maine. She's published five novels, the book of Mandolin Player, Dovecote, Tapisser, Cow Palace, and her most recent Adventurine, excuse me, Adventurine and the Reckoning, which we have at Vos Library, and three poetry chapbooks. A graduate of Bowdoin College and the Stone Coast MFA program of the University of Southern Maine, she has taught literature and creative writing at the high school level for more than 30 years. She has three children, five grandchildren, and two cats. And without further ado, please help me welcome Anne Britting Olson. Hi, Anne. Hey, thank you, Deborah. Look at my friends. Round of applause. Only, yeah, I see two people I don't know and three people I do. So, hi, everybody. I'm really excited to see you. Um, uh, Deborah has done a pretty good job of telling you who I am and three of you, oh, and now four that Sue has joined us, four of you know everything about me that you absolutely need to know. Um, I am the luckiest person in the world, primarily because all I ever wanted to do in my whole entire life was write stories. And it took me 50 odd years to get the first novel published in the first novel was this one, the book of the mandolin player. And since then, if you can imagine, I've been able to put out a novel a year for five years. <laughs> and the kicker, the thing that makes makes me the luckiest person in the world is that I actually have two new novels coming out next year. So um, save your money, put them into your piggy bank, and um, then you can buy them. <laughs> My books, um, starting with The Mandolin Player, I have three books that are um, main based. And then I have three books which um, generally involve a strange and easily frightened American woman who winds up in difficulties in the UK. And the newest one, Aventurine and the Reckoning, the beautiful blue color, blue is my favorite color, by the way. Um, this newest one follows that pattern. The main character in this particular novel, and I'm hugging it because I do love it. Um, the main character in this particular novel is a writer named Aventurine Morrow. And if you're familiar with um, the writer, Susan Orlean, she wrote uh, the library book, which is my absolute favorite of hers. She wrote um, um, The Orchid Thief and a number of other nonfiction books, which are, um, very carefully researched and really interestingly constructed. Um, Aventurine is a writer in the vein of Susan Orlean. She writes nonfiction. And when this particular story opens, she has been tasked with working on a biography of a very, very, very old woman who had joined the SOE, the Strategic Operative Executive for Great Britain when she was 16. She lies about her age. She gives them forged documents and she in effect becomes a spy. And she's now in her middle nineties, approaching the end of her life. And she's decided that now is the time for her to tell her story. And Aventurine is the person to whom she would like to tell that story. So when, as I said, when the book opens, Aventurine is traveling to the UK. She's traveling with her nephew and her nephew is um, a person who is very distressed, very depressed. His father has recently died under very mysterious circumstances. 
and um, he's floundering. So his mother asks Aventurine to take him when she goes on her research trip in an attempt to bring him out of his black dog funk. Um, and I won't tell you how successful she is. I know that Stephen, you've read the book, so you know. Um, Jenny, have you read it? Jenny knows. Um, James, have you? Yes. <laughs> what about you, Sue? <laughs> Not yet. Okay, you still have a chance. <laughs> and my other two new friends, I don't know, have you? No? Well, maybe I can interest you, so you'll like to, since Deborah has it at the library. Um, I found amongst the people who have in fact read this that the 94-year-old spy, Genevieve Smithson, is a favorite character, how shall we say? Because um, as Aventurine says, and I hope you'll pardon my language, but um, she calls her one of the badass bitches of Britain. But she's one that nobody knows about and Aventurine is hoping to change that. So if I could, I'd like to read you a little bit. Um, and in fact, got all these choices here in these little bookmarks. I'd like to read to you from the beginning of chapter six where Aventurine is first interviewing Genevieve. And because I'm old, I'll put these on so I can actually see what I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, this is the opening to chapter six is in Genevieve's own words. And she says this to Aventurine. She says, I still remember the first man I killed. By that, I mean I remember viscerally, a full body sensation, as though it were happening now in real time. It's one thing to do the crash course with the SOE, one thing to look into the eyes of the instructor. They all had such flat eyes. They knew most of us operatives would be dead within six months and say, yes. I was prepared to kill. But remember, none of us had ever killed as far as we knew before we were inserted. And then we revert to Aventurine, who says, her intensity frightened me. And I was immediately aware of the disconnect. This elderly woman, back straight in the high-backed library chair, Dark eyes, brilliant and incisive, but skin tanned, wrinkled, speaking so matter of factly of the violence her age spotted hands had done. We sat facing each other in a dim and musty room surrounded by books. My phone set on record, sat next to my digital recorder on the table between us while I took notes of her words, her looks, her surroundings. When I had knocked on the blue door of a row house an hour earlier, I had expected to be allowed in by a housekeeper or secretary. I was surprised then and couldn't hide it when the door was opened by someone who could only be Genevieve Smithson herself, the woman at Dick Turpin's grave. They'd run into each other the previous day. Editorial insert. There are ghosts, she said now, her eyes narrowing as she assessed me, and there are ghosts. I'd rather thought that was you yesterday, but she hadn't let on then and she gave no explanation now as she allowed me entrance, then snicked a series of locks into place. No stick today, though several stood at the ready in a tall vase in the hall at the foot of the stairway. Genevieve Smithson turned sharply on her heel and walked away down the carpeted, carpeted hallway. I was obviously meant to follow. I turned for a moment to count the locks, of which there were several. The street noise was muffled now, leaving only the echoing tick of a parlor clock from the room to my left. I followed her, my footsteps deadened. The hall runner beneath my feet was thick and I thought expensive. She stood in the library with her hand on the back of a chair from which she shooed a tabby cat and indicated I should take the seat across the table. Tea had been laid. I'm glad you're punctual. I'd have served you cold tea otherwise. 
her tone implied that this was a test, possibly one in a series. At least I had passed the first hurdle. We sat, chit-chatted in the way people do before they get down to real business about the weather, my journey from the US and from London, but I felt instinctively that she was impatient to get to the interview and that this socializing was an act. She would have had to have been good at acting, working in espionage. She would have to be fluent in French too. Continuez-vous à pratiquer votre français? Excuse my French. I asked a test of my own. Si vous voulez, vous, mm, si vous voulez jouer à des jeux, je suis bien meilleur. Again, I apologize. I immediately felt foolish, which was no doubt her intention. I had in my career interviewed celebrities, criminals, heads of state. I prided myself on having developed an absolutely no reason why a woman of over 90 should cause me such discomposure. The constant value of waiting. There was an aloofness to her that both challenged me to break it down and made me despair that I ever would. She had, after all, rebuffed all other reporters who would have told her story until she had chosen me. She was the one who had made the initial back my chair, momentary surrender. She cut a slice of cake with an ornate silver server, plated it, and handed it across. I felt as though I was being given a reward for following unspoken orders. Apple cake, she said. I made it myself this morning. Indeed, it was still warm. Forbidden fruit, I replied. Perhaps that's why it's always been my favorite. Genevieve's voice was arch. Shall we begin? In my initial interviews with subjects, I'd fallen into a pattern over the years. Let them begin to tell their stories in their own way, then ask questions to probe further or to get at material they hadn't brought up. After looking at my phone and recorder in mild distaste, Genevieve began. She both spoke clearly and distinctly as though she'd assessed her audience and material and decided upon her presentation accordingly. Something told me, that she would be one of those subjects who tried to control the interview, tried to control the story, but it was my job to wrest the control away. And we'll go back to Genevieve's voice. So sentry, no more than a boy, but I didn't know that until he lay, gently gurgling his lifeblood away on the ground before us, not much older than I was. I wondered fleetingly whether he too had lied about his age to join this great adventure the war. The moment we met was the moment when it became far more than a game for both of us. It was like being blooded after the fox hunt, save for the fact that I took him from behind, reaching around to plunge my knife into his throat as I had been taught. Only blood was on my hand, and I quickly wiped that off on the tail of his coat. I remember thinking of the line from Macbeth, you know the one, who would have thought the old man to have so much blood in him? But I had neither the time nor the inclination to fall into insanity like Lady Macbeth. Pierre and I merely dragged the boy out of the path and moved on. I kept thinking though, about what a beautiful night this was, the sky above black velvet and spangled with stars, the sound of far off night birds in the sighing trees. And beyond all that, me, Genevieve, the angel of death, if you will. It was heady, that power. And I'll pause there. And shift gears a little bit. I want to tell you about when I was writing the story. I'll tell you a story about a story. I have a number of friends who live in the UK, including um, a couple, Leslie and Steve, who live in York. 
And I met Leslie and Steve when I was with a rambling group walking across um, the South Downs, the White Horses Walk. And at that time, Leslie invited me to come up and walk the York Walls with her. And it took me about seven years to get up there to walk the walls with Leslie. But by then I had this story in mind and I had sent Leslie a message. And I said, you know, if you were going to kill somebody in York, where would you do it? And she said, well, let's take a walk around and have a look. So we went up onto the York Walls at Bootham Bar, which is just outside of the Shambles. And then we walked around. Part of the walls uh, are no longer extant, so you have to come down and you have to walk on the street until you get to the next part of the wall that still exists and go back up. And we circled around and it took us several hours because we were going very slowly and every once in a while we'd stop and we'd look over the wall and I'd say, how about here? Do you think we could kill somebody here? And she'd say, no, no, a lot of dog walkers go here. And so if you threw somebody off the wall here, they would be found almost immediately. So that's probably not a good place. So we'd walk on a bit further. And then I'd say, well, well, how about this place? This place looks kind of good. She's like, no, the wall is too low. If you threw somebody off the wall here, they'd probably break an arm. Maybe they'd break a leg, but they wouldn't die from this. And so we kept going until we found a really good spot. And um, then we took copious pictures and made all sorts of notes. And she told me, because Leslie is an archeologist by trade, she told me about the particular history of the wall we were, where we were standing and the breach that was underneath us and why it, was, why it was in fact that way, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't um, until we got to that point and I was taking all these pictures that I realized that um, we had attracted a following. Um, people were on our wall walk. Um, <laughs> apparently being our audience for attempted murder. And that was a good walk. If you were going to um, not plan a murder and if you were just going to get up and walk the walls without stopping, without coming down for a pint or to use the facilities or what have you, it would probably take you mm, conservatively about two hours to do that nonstop. And it took us about three hours and then we were tired. So then we went out for a pint. So I wanted to show you some pictures. I hope you don't mind. Um, Deborah is allowing me to do a little screen share and I'll show you some of these pictures that I took when we were doing this research. And we'll see if I can actually find this blasted thing. Do, 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 do. Okay, I need to go here and then I need to screen share here. All right, my lovelies, um, I won't put this into slideshow mode. I, I just uh, gathered these pictures in a Google slide presentation so that I could have them all at one place so you could see them. Um, the first picture <laughs> that I have up here, uh, my friend Leslie, the archeologist took once she received her copy of the book. She took it up on the walls and she was trying to find the view of, um, of York Minster that our cover designer had put on the book. And as you can see, the Minster on the cover and the Minster from this particular place are pretty spot on. Um, this particular bridge is a lot smaller and it's over here. But anyway, that's that's from my archaeologist friend Leslie. And by the way, don't throw anybody off the wall here because you throw them into the road and they'll probably just get run over by a car. Um, moving right along, if you if you go up onto the wall at Bootham Bar as we did, um, there's a little self-service basket and if you drop a pound in it you can get a get a map 
just like this. Mine is a little bit beat now after all that time. So we actually went up right here, as I said, you know, very close to the minster and we went all the way around. But just so you know, um, where we threw somebody off, we made it all the way around to right here before we threw anybody off. So as you're reading, if you're looking out, there it is. Um, for those of you who are interested, right down here, there we go. Um, here's a picture that I took from the road of Micklegate Bar. Um, the bars, of course, are the gates through the early walls. Um, originally, the city was contained within the walls, but over the intervening centuries, it's grown so much that it's on both sides of the walls, and these just happen to clog up traffic now in a delightful sort of way. Um, I had asked my friend Leslie about these statues at the top of this particular gate. I, you know, did they, were they anybody in particular? And she said, oh, they're just some random saints. And she said, originally, this was the place where um, traders would have their heads put on spikes. And then eventually when they stopped putting traders heads on spikes, then they put up these statues, but these are replacement statues, not the original statues because those got all worn out. Okay. Um, one of my friends, not Leslie, but um, another one of my British friends who's always, always helps me when I'm writing these stories, um, claims that I lift conversations wholesale and put them in the stories. And she spends a lot of time picking through them and saying, that sounds like what Roger said to you. That sounds like what we were talking about when we were in Ludlow Castle. Yes, yes it was, I stole it. Um, this is the gate at the bottom of Bale Hill. Um, there's a great mound up here where there originally was um, a castle that was built shortly shortly after the Norman invasion. That's long since gone, but you can see that uh, you go in this little gatehouse and the stairs go up here and the wall goes this way. And this is the closest entrance to the York Wall um, to Genevieve Smithson's house. I know exactly where Genevieve Smithson's house is in York because my same friend, um, Julia and I play a game called House of the Day where we look at real estate sites and pick up houses for our characters to live in. So yes, I know exactly where Genevieve's house is. It's over here. Um, and I had to put this picture in because it's the most wonderfully named tower on the entire, on the entire wall. Bitch Daughter Tower. Uh, apparently, um, the daughter portion of the name was originally daughter, um, a bedroom, and it was actually a prison. And so it was uh, ostensibly the most horrible place to sleep until you die. So yes, it's a, it's a bitch bedroom. But um, there's a point in here where uh, Genevieve and Aventurine are walking the walls and Genevieve says that her husband always said this particular point in the wall was named after her. Oh, sorry, got excitable there. Um, it's not, it's named after me. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then last but not least, yes, this is the place where you commit your murder because the train station is out here. The old train station is inside the wall here. And there are two cuts that were made through the wall, two breaches in the wall that were made during the Victorian period for the trains to enter the city itself to get to the train station. And when you think about, you know, this is this is um, a medieval wall primarily built on the remains of a pre-medieval wall. And the Victorians are like, yeah, but we got to put the train in there. So let's just bash great holes in it. So they did. 
And then um, the very last picture I threw up here is a picture um, from the New Forest Folk Festival. The New Forest Folk Festival takes place in the New Forest um, in the south of England. And the second half of Aventurine takes place at a music festival, which um, if you drove the roads that Aventurine and Paul drive in in her car, you would get to this music festival specifically. And this one was, um, as Aventurine calls it, a particularly cuddly music festival. That stage that you see there is the only stage. And basically it's in a farmyard. There's some farm buildings and then there's a family who runs the food tent and the food tent has fish and chips and lasagna and chips and sausage and chips and a shepherd's pie and chips. And every day somebody would come out and cross off one of the things on the menu board, but there were always chips. So they ran out of everything by the Sunday, but they still had chips. So nobody starved. Um, so I just thought I would throw that up there because as I said, the second half of the book takes place at the music festival. Um, and in the second half, you're introduced to two particularly interesting characters of whom I'm quite fond. Um, one of whom is a boy who befriends Aventurine's nephew. His name is Lance. I love him. Sue, Lance is in uh, eccentric circles because I loved him so much. <laughs> um, and there is a soulful singer songwriter named Gio Constantine. His real name is George, but Gio sounds like a better musician's name. So he doesn't like being called George, but he's a soulful singer songwriter primarily because another one of my very important British friends, a musician um, named Ian Blake, just kept making cracks to me about soulful singer songwriters. So I had to put this guy in there just for him. Easter eggs, they're everywhere. So I'm gonna get out of here. And there you all are back. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read you just a little bit more. And I think we'll skip a little bit ahead. There we are. Do, 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 do. Um, I'm gonna stay with Genevieve and Aventurine, if you don't mind because I don't wanna to go too far in the story because if you're someone who hasn't read it yet, I don't wanna spoil things for you. So I just want to give you some things from the beginning that might pique your interest. And if you've read it before, you already know anyway. So we'll skip ahead till uh, Aventurine and Genevieve are walking the walls together for the first time. Genevieve, um, it turns out, is first of all, an extremely fit elderly woman. She walks the walls every day. That's what she does for her exercise. And she does that primarily because as an elderly woman, people are always encouraging her to move out of her own home and to move into some sort of care facility because she's so old, obviously she needs to be taken care of. In any case, she's also very haunted, as you might be if you joined the SOE at 16 and stabbed some guy in the throat. It happens. She says, Genevieve set a brisk pace, neither looking left nor right. I prided myself on being a fairly strong walker, but I was hard pressed to keep pace with her, despite the difference in our ages. Over the light traffic, I could hear the snick of her stick on the pavement as she used it more to set her tempo than as any support. After a few moments, when we turned onto Upper Price Street, I realized that my own stick was wrapping out the same cadence. She obviously didn't need a walking stick. Her back was straight, her step so purposeful that it was difficult to credit her age. 
I found myself wondering about it, how she punctuated her walking with the sound, something she'd obviously picked up since her sojourn behind enemy lines in France, where she would have had to learn to move silently. The story of her first kill still enthralled me and frightened me, and I shivered. What must it have been like as a mere teenager to sneak up on the enemy, to swiftly reach around, pull his jaw upward, to stab surgically, to eliminate him without a sound? That had been her first, and she remembered it vividly. I looked over at her profile, the hawk-like nose, the determined mouth, no doubt there would have been others, probably several others. She had been behind the lines until the liberation and she had survived where so many others had not. Commander Smith, whoever he had been, had let her know that she was a tool for use in the great machine and that she was unlikely to last after doing her part for a couple of months. Instead, she had outlasted the enemy, the war, and most likely Commander Smith himself. I was crossing the A-1036 with a murderer. But in the service of one's country, was one really a murderer or was one a patriot? We passed through Victor Gate and after a few moments found ourselves accessing the wall at Skelder Gate and Bale Hill. I followed Genevieve into a small tower and up the stone stairs to the talk. I tried not to appear winded when she waited for me to complete my ascent. I walk the walls every day, she said, tapping the toe of a hiking boot on the stone. Keeps me young, helps me pretend I'm in control here. You're not? She turned and walked again. We were going clockwise. I'm an old woman, she tossed over her shoulder, ironically. 16 in 1943? Yes, she was an old woman. But she did not walk like one, and age had not softened her in the least. The world is not kind to old women, she said. I fell back behind her to let her couple pass going the other direction. Then I pulled back abreast. Especially old women with no children, no husband, no living relatives. You have your home. For as long as I can hold on to it, she said, still with the ironic note in her voice. My general practitioner and everyone else in any position of petty power keep urging me to give up my home, to move into some sort of assisted living facility. And so I can't take care of myself. If she could have spat over the wall onto her general practitioner and those in petty power, she would have. Her contemptuous expression made that clear. She had not slowed her pace. My thighs were burning and I did my best to hide my discomfort. I thought of the dim library, the high back chair, the tabby cat winding around her legs tail aloft. Hers was a home formed around her personality. Genevieve, I knew, would not leave that easily, not without a fight. And I did not envy the fool who attempted to move her. Fortunately, she said, and we moved aside again for another group of three laughing young people. Fortunately, I have enough money set by to live on, enough to have a char in twice a week. I have my books and I have these walls. She ran a hand over the pitted stone surface to her left. Then she looked up at the sky where, the, where clouds scudded past. The breeze was picking up. When I die, I hope it's in my own bed, just suddenly done and done, just as my husband did husband. This was the first time she'd mentioned his existence. I tried to imagine the sharp, hard woman in love. I tried to imagine her softening to someone's caress. Obviously, I was now supposed to start digging about her husband. Again, I had this sudden sense that she was playing me information-wise, a bit here so I could run with it, a bit more, and then she would set the hook and reel me in leisurely knowing that I'd be unable to escape. Genevieve was enjoying herself. I made a mental, who were her friends? With whom did she spend time? Did she play them in conversation as she was playing me? Had she been like this at 16? 
Was it part of her attraction to the agent who recruited her or to Commander Smith who had trained her? I imagined a clash of wills, those men, this girl. Sure, she had lied about her age, but I wondered whether they had known that she had lied, whether she knew that they knew, and whether any of them had cared. We paused at a place where the walk became a wide circle and looked back toward the ancient bailey. That ancient man-made hill was green with grass and populated by trees, the tops of which swayed in the breeze. I clutched my walking stick, tapping it on the runic stone map set at my feet. Clifford's Tower and Bale Hill were incised on either side of the wavy lines representing the river. My husband, Genevieve said, her expression softening, liked to tell people this particular place was named after me. She cocked her head, waiting. I obliged, and its name is, was that almost a smile? Bitch daughter corner. All righty then. Well, I think that's all I want to read to you, but I'm going to look over here and see if anybody wrote anything in the chat. Nobody did. So I wonder if there's anybody who would like to ask me any questions about Aventurine or any of these other books or any of my other adventures or anything else. Jenny's got one and then Sue's got one. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I will join the Genevieve Smithson fan club. <laughs> I think she's a terrific character. And um, I'm wondering if, if we've got some more adventure to come. Um, maybe is she there again or not? Um, strangely, when I wrote this story, I had not thought of any of these people as a recurring character. I thought, oh, here is the story and here is the end of it. And then um, when it was accepted for publication by Encircle, it was actually the cover designer whom I love. Her name is Deirdre. She made this, she made it blue because she knows blue is my favorite color. Um, and she said, I'm going to put an Aventurine Morrow thriller here. I'm going to put a tag here in case you write another one. <laughs> um, if that's not a little um, backhanded manipulation, I'm not really sure what is. So I'm, I am actually writing another adventuring story. Um, it does have some of the same characters in it. It has some entirely new ones including um, one based on a man that I met in Lincoln Cathedral, totally accidentally, who did want to talk about um, the badass bitches of Britain with me in the chapter house at Lincoln Cathedral. So um, I'm going to have to finish up this one and dedicate it to Deirdre, the cover designer, because it's her fault. Oh, I'm, looking, okay. I'm looking forward to that one. <laughs> well, Jenny, that's very close geographically somewhat to your stomping ground because you're Hull. I, I grew up in Hull, yes. Yeah, so the other Hull. side of the river. Yep. It, it's the wrong side of the river, but I'll, I'll let it go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sue, what were you thinking? Same thing. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, Sue is also a writer who is published by the same publisher as this. So it's very delightful to have Sue here with us. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Stephen has a question. He's also very close to Lincoln. Yes, I am. Uh, in fact, my son lives there. It's about 35 minutes drive from me. And I shall be going to York on the 25th of May this year for a, a very particular visit. And I'm looking forward to you coming over to this country again, when I hope we might meet. Meanwhile, I'd like to say that I have now read all of your books, your novels. I have, but have not read, yet read, um, 
oh, I keep on forgetting, The Church at Tintagel, mm -hmm. your first type book. Very yep. un, unusual name. Um, but, uh, I'm, I'm keeping that fire as, as a treat for myself. Now, when um, I think your cover designer gave you a huge compliment and vote of confidence by in that tagline. And uh, I had thought there must be more to follow. And just one little thing that I wonder if it will ever be enlarged upon someplace else, and that is the death of Paul's father. Ah, yes. Um, I was just going to leave that um, as, a, as an ambiguity when I first thought of this story as a single story. But as I've been thinking forward, first of all, I realized that I had painted myself with this particular book into a rather horrifying corner, which I'm going to have to do horrible things in order to get out of eventually. Um, but I you will never find out in, in the Lincoln book anything further about Paul's father. But it has become a nagging idea for a third one. Mm -hmm. And of course, I, I it's it's one of those kernels of an idea that I have not taken out and I have not looked at very carefully because I don't think that it's properly germinated at this point. I have a sense of something, but I don't want to look at it too soon. Mm -hmm. See, James has inflicted upon him, James, this young person over here in the corner um he spent a while in my creative writing class and he knows that i think that your stories live somewhere here in the back of your head and then they crawl up and make themselves known and in, in your frontal lobe eventually so you just have to keep working your material until finally you realize oh right that's what it is. I think they're all in there, but you have to let them come out, which is a really creepy way of thinking of how to make a story. But we go with it. <laughs> yeah, something something will happen. Just you'll have to wait for it. Um, if any of you have ever read any of the Louise Penny novels, Inspector Gamache, Jenny, I know you have. Um, she does that same thing. She has a book and the mystery is encapsulated in this book but there's always a bigger story that's growing and traveling forward into the next book and the next book some of her bigger stories go for five and six installments i don't think i could take it that long but i suddenly realized oh that's what this is doing here's a story and here's a further story and can you see that James has his hand up? No, I didn't. I saw that he moved over in the corner. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, James. Okay, Anne. <laughs> um, How's that feel? Now, <laughs> we'll see how much of this is uh, a question more than an observation. But I had a feeling that Genevieve Smithson would be... Um, the most probably the most beloved character from the book um so i want to talk instead about mick and okay. i'm going to uh pronounce it mick because i'm not french so uh i cannot pronounce her full name but um i what i want to know is if mick is meant to be um a subtle or maybe not so subtle foil to aventurine and my reasoning is because um, why that sort of came in my head is because whenever we see um, Mick and she's an important character, but um, is not, she doesn't get a lot of uh, screen time or page time, I guess. Um, 
but whenever we do hear Which from her in whatever way. yes um whenever we do hear from her in whatever situation um uh she's in she kind of has the opposite reaction to what um aventurine or the readers probably think that she should have um and a lot of that can be attributed to the circumstances of what she's gone through and everything but i think that um while aventurine is throughout the novel she's trying to stay optimistic about what's going on things are kind of crashing and she's trying to hold it together and i feel like mick is kind of the antithesis of that and is just kind of um, putting those worries right back into Aventry's mind the whole time. I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, there's one point, um, for those of you who haven't read, Aventurine and uh, Michelin are, are twins. And so they call each other Abby and Mick. Um, Michelin is Paul's mother. And she is, first of all, widowed under extremely strange and mysterious circumstances. But she also has a 23-year-old son who is reacting very badly. He seems to be having some sort of mental health crisis. She's unable to help him. And there is, I won't say for people who haven't read it, there is tension about this young person between the two sisters and when Mick reaches out to Av to Abby and asks her to help with Paul um, she does that extremely reluctantly because that's um, I think she sees it as giving up some of her maternal power some of her oh, I don't know, maternal responsibility. And she's not really comfortable with that. So she is a person who is not at all optimistic at this point. She's a person who is uh, basically terrified at this point. Um, so when she finally gets up off her butt and flies across to come and, and like try to try to help or take charge or something. I was thinking, good job, Mick. It's about time. Good job. But yeah, she's, she's far more reactive than active. Maybe that's what you're sensing. Yes, I think so. Okay. Oh, Jenny. Actually, I have another question or another 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 thought. Is it because I, I guess because I liked Genevieve Smithson so much, um, I wondered whether you had considered writing her story because you know you read about a character who's been there and done those things, and you wonder what's how somebody like that reacts to coming back from the war, and what sort of life that leads her into. And she's obviously been married. She's been happy from the brief references that we get in the novel. Um, but, you know, you wonder what that life has been like. And that just seems such a fertile area mm -hmm. to explore over quite a long lifespan, you know. Um, and one, one, I mean, gosh, she could do all sorts of things, you know. <laughs> and, and she has been doing all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Which she's not letting you know about um <laughs> all right when they're looking at the uniform there's a scene for those who haven't read it when they're upstairs looking at um Genevieve's uniform from the war and there's a running joke there about um the SOE Facebook page and the SOE Instagram <laughs> like, all right Gee, how do you keep in touch with your friends? <laughs> well, they're all dead, but yeah, she she's led an exciting and checkered life. And um, there's, at the risk of sounding like I'm promoting a total other book, um, Sue 
and my publisher at Encircle um, a couple of months ago put out a book of short stories called uh, called Eccentric Circles. Oh yeah, I saw it advertised on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And all the short stories in that collection are written by people who have had books published by Encircle. And the only rule for submission was that it had to feature a character in one of the books that Encircle has, has published. So um, my foray in that book is a short story called Ulnar Splint. And an ulnar splint is the splint that you get on the side of your hand if you have a boxer's fracture. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the two characters that I chose to um, write about in ulnar splint are Genevieve and the boy Lance. Uh -huh. So she's having a story. Good. <laughs> I'll have to get hold of that book. <laughs> In a library near you. Libraries are your friends. Yes, yeah, probably. <laughs> Anybody else have any thoughts? Well, I'll just say I tend not to borrow books because I'm an author. I buy books. Mm -hmm. And I think I've just got to add that one to my shopping list. And the strange thing is, that amongst all the books that I buy, yours tend to be the ones that I'm reading. <laughs> well, it's a good thing that I have two coming out next year because you know eventually you will have read all, all of those. Um, the, two, the two that I have coming out next year, I, I told you, you know, um, some of these books are main books and they are not mysterious. And some of these books are UK books and they are mysterious. And the two books that I have coming out, I have one coming out um, in March, March 21st, first day of spring. And it's called The Springs. And that's a main book. Okay. And then uh, Aventuring 2, Aventuring mm -hmm. on the Bailgate okay. is coming in September of next year. So I have one of each for next year. Very good. Incidentally, if I may give a tiny weeny tip, um, don't have your British speaking characters refer to silverware. We only say cutlery. Okay. He's right. <laughs> <laughs> no. All right, I have, I have to tell you a story about Jenny. <laughs> okay. um, my son started when he was eating at the table he would start putting his food on the back of his fork and eating like that so he never switched hands which is totally American switching hands with your silverware. So he just started to do it as he had seen British people do it on TV. And um, his stepmother got on his case about it. And Jenny told me to tell his stepmother that he's eating like the queen now. And she guessed that was all right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he pays any attention to any of us any longer anyway. <laughs> no, he's quite old enough to decide for himself. <laughs> <laughs> the first one of yours that I read was um, Carl Palace. Mm -hmm. And that was a completely different novel, really to probably any that I'd read in my life, I should think, um, because it, it, it was so definitely American. And I, uh, I, have, I have a great love for America. In fact, my, I was married on the 4th of July and two of my cats are called Stars and Stripes. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
I, I, I literally have friends from coast to coast. Uh, um, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But that was that was a that was a book that um, really engaged me quite quickly. Now, one that did not, but oh, I was so glad I stayed with it. Believe it or not, was Tapasa. Mm -hmm. Because its lead character, whose sorry name escapes me right now, um, was basically such an objectionable woman in those early chapters. And so I thought, I know some people like this. Do I really want to spend some precious time reading? Why? I was so glad I, I stuck with that. Really, really, really. I love your, the level of your research. I'm most impressed by it. And um, you're, you're obviously very skilled with the uh, taking notes and I, I'm pleased you admitted to stealing conversations wholesale because um, that's, that's what a good author should do, I think. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's funny, not... that, funny that you should mention it. In Tapizer, um, there is a conversation where people are, um, some of the characters are in St. Lawrence's Church in Ludlow. And there are some beautiful stained glasses over the great front doors. And one of them is Arthur Tudor. And I was there with my friends, Julia and Roger. And Roger said, bit of a feminine face, isn't it? And yep, 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 they say that in here. Yeah. It turns out to be a most fantastic love story. And um, I was really disappointed to discover that the portrait you mentioned at Hever Castle isn't there. It's fictitious. I was quite <laughs> persuaded that it must be um, real. How dare you make things up? <laughs> <laughs> the portrait of Arthur Tudor is there. Oh. Um, but the tapestry that they go to see there is totally fictional because the, the tapisers in the story are totally made up. Right, right. Actually, well, one of your stories that I've enjoyed most <laughs> was, uh, was Dovecote, um, oh, sure. which, which, which it isn't researched on, in, to the same level as, as tapiser and, uh, and adventuring. Um, but I, I really liked the atmosphere that you evoked in that, uh, there were some distinctly creepy sections in that, which I thought were very effective, and I really enjoyed reading them. <laughs> I absolutely um, agree. This is, this is actually, um, for Jenny and anyone else familiar with it, this is um, a book that by right should be dedicated to the British author, Phil Rickman. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> that man is the king of creepy. Absolutely, yeah. And he's so good. He dances along the edge between is this real or is this supernatural? And he just gets that balance perfect. He's a really good writer. <laughs> Anne, I'm, I'm going to say we've really come to the end of our hour with you, but I have to say it's so nice that your fan club joined us this evening. <laughs> And, yes, and yeah, we, we um, don't even get stickers, you know. We no. don't even get stickers. I mean, God. And I just want to thank you, Anne, because it's just really such a pleasure to have such an intimate conversation with with you and your work. And I'm so glad um, your friends have have joined us tonight. So I am going to close us out because I promised people this is an hour presentation and again thank you very much for joining us so we'll conclude tonight and um all of us at Vos Library want to thank you for attending our VOSA virtual Wednesday series and we hope that you'll spread the word even in England and join us next Wednesday even though I know it's super late for all of you right now um, next Wednesday April 6th we have Laura Swami Lecker from Avian Haven Wild Bird Rehabilitation Center um, located here in Freedom, Maine, and she'll share a citizen's guide to helping the birds of Maine. So good night, everybody. Stay healthy. Take care. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Uh,